Radical opponents had long waged their holy war against abortion clinics. What the hell was that? Bombings, arson, assassinations that terrified many women. Uh, we do have one confirmed fatality. This bombing at a Birmingham clinic killed a police guard. In the mid-90s, from Boston to Florida, angry zealots murdered seven people, three of them doctors. The violence not only frightened a number of abortion clinics into closing, it also caused a public backlash. Can't be the yelling and the screaming and the uh, bombing abortion clinics and the marching outside and waving. It's got to be the soft but intelligent cell of the facts. And so the courts became the new battleground over the unborn. But year after year, the religious right lost every Supreme Court decision on abortion. Falwell and others were determined to reverse that, using their political clout to make sure new justices Do you solemnly swear that pass the Christian conservative abortion litmus test. The two men President George Bush nominated to the Supreme Court, Chief Justice John Roberts, had a cup of coffee with the nominee and, and Justice Samuel Alito. I, Samuel A. Alito Jr., do solemnly swear. Met their test. The U.S. Supreme Court today handed a major victory to abortion rights opponents. A month before Falwell died, the Supreme Court, on a five to four vote, did put an end to one practice called partial birth abortion. Justice Alito became the decisive fifth vote. That is the culmination for me of about 35 years of work. A welcome victory for Jerry Falwell, but not yet enough. I don't think we have five votes on Roe v. Wade. I think we're probably one or two votes short. As we talked that last week of his life, Falwell seemed to recognize that his battle to end all abortions would have to be won by the next generation of God's warriors. My children are more likely to see this, uh, this victory won than I am. I think we're 50 years away. We've got to just stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, and never give up. If this graduation sounds like a religious ceremony, in a way it is. This is the first class of lawyers to emerge from Liberty University's new law school. It was Jerry Falwell's final creation, a law school where the Ten Commandments are found carved outside these classroom doors. This is our Supreme Court room. It's modeled after the United States Supreme Court. Nine chairs for nine justices, a classroom that's meant to be a clone. And obviously it's no accident because you want to change what the Supreme Court has ruled on. And we do. We say that the Supreme Court room reflects our supreme vision to restore the rule of law. Matthew Staver is dean of the law school, a minister who became a lawyer because of abortion. He says no such right is written into the Constitution. That doesn't sound like a rule of law to me. That sounds like somebody making their own ideology under the guise of the rule of law. Please be seated. It is Staver who's training what the late Jerry Forwell called his next generation of pit bulls. May it please the court. What are the pit bulls to do? Well, the pit bulls, according to Dr. Falwell, and really what our vision is, is to raise a new generation of people that understand the rule of law, that are taught that from our Christian traditions and worldview. Staver does more than mold minds. He also runs Liberty Council, a legal group which takes its fight over religious freedom into the courts all over the country. Twice he has argued before the real Supreme Court. Consider adoption. We would love to adopt your little baby. The first time against restrictions on picketing at abortion clinics. Staver's words that day. Abortion speech or speech about abortion lies at the very core of the First Amendment. 
the last time on behalf of the laws of God. This is the United States Supreme Court when I argued the Ten Commandments case out of Kentucky. On March At issue, Kentucky. the public display of the Ten Commandments inside a county courthouse. Staver lost in a five to four ruling. But there's nothing in the Bible that would say to Staver, thou shalt not litigate again. And so, way down on the Suwannee River, Dixie County, Florida has become the Dean's new battleground over the Ten Commandments. This six-ton granite monument carved by the local gravestone salesman sits on the courthouse steps. It is a clear example of what the Supreme Court has disallowed. A standalone monument on government property with an obvious religious message, love God and keep his commandments. Uh, maybe some of the things in the Constitution need to be changed, such as this right here, you know? Uh, I'm not authority on law or nothing like that, but I know for a fact that the people in this, this county right here are in favor of it. This time, Staver expects to win. Why? There's absolutely no question that the court has a different makeup and will likely come to a different decision. The Supreme Court has become ground zero in this combat between law and religion, the final word on God's place in public life. I went there with CNN's senior legal analyst, Jeffrey Tubin. So here is this phenomenal bastion of jurisprudence inside of the Ten Commandments. In several different places, including very prominently on the ceiling of the courtroom. How do the Ten Commandments get onto the Supreme Court building? Well, the the Constitution has never been interpreted to mean that you could have no reference to God anywhere. I mean, many courtrooms say, in God we trust. In God we trust is part of the American dialogue, and yet the religious right would have you believe that there's no mention of God anywhere in our public sphere. It's on the currency. It's, it's, it's on the currency, and they say, because it's on the currency, there's nothing wrong with it being in the schools or in the courthouses, or in the Capitol. But they also play the victim somewhat. Are they victimized? Well, they feel like they're losing the culture wars. They feel like it's an increasingly secular society, and keeping prayer out of the schools, keeping the Ten Commandments um, out of the courthouses is part of how they're being victimized. It's just more of a respect for God. At Liberty University, twin sisters Mandy and Megan Chapman feel they were victimized by a court ruling against religion. It happened at their graduation in 2006 at Russell County High School back home in rural Kentucky. Megan was the class chaplain. My faith is my life. It's what you live by. So when you get out in the world and things get hard... And she wanted to offer a prayer at commencement, but a judge ruled she could not. We talked to the seniors and one person suggested that we all do the Lord's Prayer together, you know, as a senior class. Defiantly, the seniors stood up in prayer. and then see the rest of the 3,000 people that were in our tiny gym stand up and just cheering and we're just, it was just amazing. Once you choose Christian faith, once you realize that is the way, you are God's warrior regardless. And so it's just whether you're going to pick up your sword and go for it or not. Recognizing two future Christian warriors, Dean Staver arranged scholarships for both sisters to come to Liberty University. Megan hopes to go to law school. What do you think God has called you to do with a law degree or, or as a lawyer? To defend Christians, to defend just civil rights in general. So what issues are important to you? Um, Moral issues? The abortion issues, the gay marriage issues, the um, just situations like that. Like Megan and Mandy pledge themselves to God in church at the age of seven. Their dorm room is a testament to their faith. Why do you say that you're worried about, you know, the country's reaction to Christians? Because you are able to practice freely, you're able to worship, you're mm -hmm. able to follow the faith as you see it. It's not and that it, way everywhere, and, and we're not oblivious to that. And it's not that it's already happened, it's just like small things lead up to bigger things. 
These days, they may find a Supreme Court more sympathetic to conservative religious concerns like their own. In its first full year with Chief Justice John Roberts and his newest colleague Samuel Alito, the court has tilted noticeably to the right.